Hey, Forever family. Happy Sunday. We're so glad that you're here. We're going to identify in just a minute, but we want to tell you a little bit what we're doing tonight. I actually sent you a meme today on Instagram. Did you get my meme? It's my love language. And the meme said <laughs> it, was, it was a tweet that actually said, I don't know why y'all are complaining about wearing masks to church. We've been doing it for years. And I think that's really funny in light I of... Didn't see that one. You, you, I send that to you because I love you. But um, we know that with testimonies, um, for us, our testimony tells a lot of our experience, strength, and hope. And it also shares about our struggles because I spent a lot of years at church with a mask on. And so we thought we'd do something different tonight. What do you, you want to tell them what we're doing? We are going to actually share our couple's testimony, which is a little bit different approach because it's sort of our combined experience at Celebrate Recovery. Um, however, normally CR would be an anonymous experience. We have chosen to uh, break that anonymity and put our our experience out there because we feel like God may be able to do something with it. So Yes. And... Um, our couple's testimony actually is very different, I think, than our individual testimony. It has some of our stories woven into it that we share in our individual testimony, but um, Celebrate Recovery gave us a lot of freedom um, as a family and about some hurts we experienced as parents and in our marriage. So we definitely want to share that. And we know that this is such a strange time during the quarantine because we're bridging. Some of you have started Celebrate Recoveries again and your state and your church, you're all meeting. And some of us are not able to do that yet. So it's in kind of this strange time. But no matter what, testimony is a powerful mm -hmm. part of Celebrate Recovery. It happens almost every other large group. Um, which is our shared experience at all of our Celebrate Recoveries. And for testimonies, one thing that we always do is we read our testimonies at any Celebrate Recovery you go to, that's part of the DNA. And that's so that you can feel safe about someone sharing their story. Um, we know what we're saying. I'm like, now you never know what's gonna come out of my mouth. Well, in a minute, you're gonna know that it's written down, it's been approved. Cheryl Baker actually read our couple's testimony and it's approved. So we do wanna share that with you. We hope that it's of benefit. We hope that it's it ministers to you and mostly we hope that it shows you how great our God is and how he works through this program to lead us to freedom and healing so without further ado I am a grateful believer and child of God through faith in Jesus finding victory over addiction to drugs and alcohol I am currently working the steps for anger control and codependency my name is Ken hi Ken I'm a grateful believer in recovery for codependency perfectionism and compulsive behaviors with food and money and my name is Megan Thank, hi, Megan. hi. Thank you in advance for letting us share our messy and miraculous journey into freedom. I was the child of a stay-at-home mom who made it her life's focus to care for me and my two siblings. Home was a safe place where I was free to be and do whatever I wanted. We never had financial struggles and my parents never fought. Well, at least that's they never let us kids see that. In the step study books, they ask, what was your family secret? And I guess that was our family secret. Despite being convinced that my parents truly loved me and thought I was a great kid, I was painfully shy and I didn't have a clue what to do with the real world. Reality was overwhelming for me, so I spent most of my time in fantasy. Even after I was very aware that I was too old to play pretend, I just withdrew into myself. The pretend was still happening, just nobody knew about it. I became very good at hiding feelings, camouflaging hurts, and reading other people's moods. I was your friend, if you were mine. I liked what you liked and I was generally afraid to be my own person. Very little would come out of my mouth that hadn't been rehearsed in my head before I would actually say it. This was the beginning of what I now recognize as the committee meetings in my head. Even as a child, I remember spending a lot of time contemplating what others were thinking about me. I was a person who was truly uncomfortable in my own skin. I had no idea what to do with conflict and I was socially awkward. My childhood was lonely, confusing, and at times pretty scary. My deepest desire was for a white picket fence, a mom who stayed who and a mom who stayed home with stayed home with us in an intact family. We had a white picket fence for a little while, but that's about it. The brokenness from my parents' lives poured out into our family's life and created a legacy of divorce, financial struggles, and neglect that led to many things not the least of which was being sexually abused by close family friends. Both of my parents were alcoholics and my mom struggled with an undiagnosed mental illness. 
the chaos, scarcity, and instability of my childhood overshadowed much of the good. However, early on I learned to deny and perform, and my childhood would have seemed idyllic if you had asked me about it when I was living it. But in my terrifyingly honest moments, my young heart deeply desired to not have to be the adult, to not be left alone, both physically and emotionally, to not fear that we wouldn't be able to pay the bills, and to simply have food to eat. I don't understand why anyone would have just one drink. I mean, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. <laughs> to me, the point of drinking was to get drunk. Otherwise, I'd be drinking soda. For me, alcohol was the magic elixir. It helped me overcome shyness and deal better, better with reality. Although I was still very self-conscious, I cared a lot less when I was loaded. I started partying the summer before sixth grade. By the time I hit high school, I believe I was a full-on functioning alcoholic. When life got challenging, I would run for the bottle. You know, the scene in Forrest Gump where he just starts running and he's not sure why, that was me. But I sure wasn't gonna run physically. So I'd run away from life, from relationships, from circumstances, from reality. I was starting to get addicted to the chaos as well. The more out of control circumstances got, the easier it was for me to rationalize drinking, blame others, and run from reality. The lack of control was my twisted attempt at controlling life. It worked until those quiet moments when it was just me, alone with my guilt and shame. In the quiet, the committee meeting would begin. And today's topic, what a worthless piece of dirt can is. My preteen and teen years were still filled with chaos, except now I started pursuing my own. Chaos was comfortable for me because that's what I knew. When the pain of my circumstances was too much to bear, I started reaching for something, anything to numb it. My first addiction was lying because it made me feel like I could control my reality. I started at a very young age. I lied about anything and everything and sometimes even believed my own lies. My second addiction was food, which I would eat compulsively if we ever had any in the house. I would hide and sneak food when I would babysit or spend the night at a friend's. The self-loathing that followed these binges became unbearable, so I moved on to alcohol when I was 14 years old. This was the numbing agent that multiple generations of my family before me had reached for, and I could see why. The relief I felt the very first time I got drunk was visceral and profound. The problem was that that relief didn't last long, and it always brought shame and remorse once it had worn off. So I tried to chase that feeling or completely deny it. There was no in-between for me, abstinent or drunk. Complete control or reckless abandon, I didn't know a middle ground. Most of my friends and almost all of the adults at that time in my life had no idea that I had a severe drinking problem and had a dangerous struggle with disordered eating. I got an acting scholarship from a well-known prep school when I was 13 and then another to a liberal arts college when I was 17 but I had been performing since I was five, and most people believed my act. The ever helpful, somewhat innocent, good girl was my role of choice, and I believed I was killing it. After high school, I figured out that if I looked like someone that you wouldn't want to hang around with, that I could control whether or not you would reject me. I could push you away with my bright orange mohawk, skull-covered jeans, and hand-painted hand studded jacket. I was causing you to reject me. In my version of reality, that hurt less than to risk the possibility of being rejected for being just me. There was an empty hole inside of me, a constant reminder that I was not okay. But I didn't know what to do about it except to run away, deny that it was there, and try to avoid those quiet moments. Life was exhausting. I remember telling myself that I could keep living like this, and at some point, I will do something different. I told myself that for a number of years. Now, I met Ken when I was 11 years old and instantly had a crush on him. Now, while he was and is amazing and worthy of all those feelings, to be honest, I had crushes on everyone. So that's my fourth addiction, if you're keeping score. Growing up watching romantic comedies and happily ever afters, there was a hidden and insidious belief that the right guy could and would make everything okay. My subconscious mantra was fashioned after the lyric to the 80s Bonnie Tyler song from Footloose, I need a hero. I thought this was a perfectly reasonable expectation. I thought salvation from my pain could be found in the right man. And it can, but the man has to be 100% man and 100% God. My salvation was and is found in Jesus, but I only discovered this after I had sought it everywhere and in everyone else. 
I was 16 when Megan met me. I didn't have any interest in an 11-year-old, thank That's goodness. Okay. But we knew each other because of one of my best friends had dated her older sister through high school and into college. They eventually got married, and Megan and I were both in the wedding party. And my buddy's new wife's little sister was smoking hot. <laughs> we were instantly attracted to each other. We dated a little, and I tried to keep it casual, but I knew that she was the one, and that scared me to death. The thought that this could be the last relationship that I would ever have spun me out of control. I still wasn't equipped to deal with reality, so I ran away from that reality into a number of shallow and empty relationships. I was finally tired of hiding, of running, of escaping. I had destroyed most of my friendships, wasted my youth chasing fun and pleasure, and alienated most of my family. My life was unmanageable, and I was ready to admit it. I had no idea how to do it, but I had a couple of friends who had quit drinking. I quit drinking and using in September 1989, and as of today, I haven't picked it back up yet. Mm -hmm. I started going to AA meetings, lots of AA meetings. I got a sponsor and I worked the steps. My sponsor told me to listen carefully to the committee in my head. How he knew I had a committee in my head, I don't know. <laughs> but he said whatever decision they reached, I should do the exact opposite. And he was right. Everything I didn't want to do were the actions that helped me begin to deal with reality. I managed to quit the drinking and doing drugs. However, I was still escaping reality. I will always find ways to escape reality. Now I was escaping into video games, work, isolation, and relationships. My addictions, compulsive behaviors, and radical insecurity had me pursuing people, places, or things that would make everything all better. Never seemed to work. My addiction to alcohol and then illegal stimulants, which I began to use to help me manage my weight, led to a physical, emotional, and moral bottom, and I stopped drinking and using January 1st, 1990. But really, I started intensely pursuing another addiction, this guy. And I would have followed Ken to the ends of the earth, but instead I followed him into Alcoholics Anonymous, which was a program I wanted to work perfectly. Actually, I wanted to act like I was working it perfectly. Really, I wanted to be Ken's everything, and I, of course, expected him to be mine. mine. In my mind of perfect and happy endings, he was going to fix me, and it was a much bigger job than we both anticipated. Because of sobriety, I was able to overcome the fear of commitment. Let me rephrase that. My love for Megan was greater than my fear of commitment, and we got married. Our wedding was a great mix of sober and not-so-sober friends and family. We asked the pastor of the church that Megan had been attending to marry us. Not long before that beautiful day, Megan asked Jesus to be the Lord of her life. To be honest, I wanted to be the Lord of her life. I knew from past experience that Jesus doesn't play second fiddle. One of us was probably going to have to leave, and Megan was changing. She was becoming much more comfortable in her own skin. One particular Sunday morning, I told her that I didn't want to go to church. Thinking that I meant that day, she asked if... I felt okay. I responded, I don't mean today, I mean ever. I had drawn a line in the sand. It was gonna be Jesus or Ken. If she responded wrong, I would have justification for never going to church again. Once again, turning my back on God. Now Jesus wooed me into faith through my second AA sponsor who invited me to a small church in Redondo Beach, California. I acknowledged my need for a savior after a women's retreat in June of 1992, and Jesus radically saved me. I had struggled with him since I was a child. My dad had shared with me from a very young age his belief that anyone who believed in Jesus was an idiot. And I believed that the Bible was written to subjugate women and marginalize people, and I struggled with issues of heaven and hell. But Acts 2.21 says that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, and I chose to believe that believe Jesus wholeheartedly. The Jesus I had mocked became the hero that I had longed for. Well, he was when I let him. I believed in Jesus, but it took me decades to believe Jesus, to truly know that he loves me, that he sees me, that he knows me and still chose me. I struggled so much with those invisible chains of my childhood, which held me captive to the belief that I wasn't worthy of being loved or nourished or protected. I would be tolerated if I didn't cause any trouble and I just kept quiet. And I spent most of my first two decades in faith trying to be people's savior so that my savior would accept me. 
to grim Brene Brown, I was hustling for my worthiness. The second principle of celebrate recovery was and is the most difficult for me to accept and it states, I earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to him and that he has the power to help me recover. I didn't know this would be my struggle after I fell in love with Jesus the summer of 1992. What I did know was that my heart felt like it literally broke when Ken told me he never wanted to go to church again. She responded to my statement with grace and love. Didn't try to manage or control my life. She just said, is it okay if I still go? She left for church and, deci and I decided that there must be more to this Jesus thing than I really understand. I went to church that Sunday and every Sunday after that. We served everywhere we could at that church. Megan ended up in the children's ministry and me with the youth. We willingly and knowingly surrendered our youth in service to Jesus, often doing the right thing for the wrong reason and resenting it. We had addressed our main addictions, but still struggled with the underlying issues that caused us to pursue them. Even though it looked like we had it all together, our lives were unmanageable. Ministry is difficult. Parenting is difficult. Marriage is difficult. I am 100% certain that without Jesus, I would have run away and sabotaged our marriage. When Celebrate Recovery entered our lives, we had just come out of a decade-long season of painful and very messy circumstances. But actually, most of our marriage <laughs> consisted of long seasons of painful and messy circumstances. The perfect life that I had longed for seemed to be available to others but not to us. We struggled with financial instability, which triggered a lot of childhood memories. I couldn't articulate my fears and pain to Ken because I wanted to be the new creation that the Bible talked about. In my mind, perfect faith meant keeping the past in the past. I didn't realize that my past was affecting my present because I had never really been honest about it. I just soldiered on. Ken and I also had our share of medical traumas and faced many devastating social rejections because our family didn't quite qualify as normal. I was constantly trying to prove my worth in everything I did, fix anything, any way I could. Every time, man. <laughs> All while battling an emotional demon that almost undid me. I was the parent present and on duty when our oldest suffered a fall that led to his traumatic brain injury. I was the one who must have done something wrong because I contracted a virus that almost killed me and our third child when I was pregnant with him. It was my body who created two boys with neurological issues and it is my body that struggles with autoimmune diseases and physical limitations. Does it all stem from my past drug use? Did I get what I deserved because I'm just not good enough? To this day, I have to fight the lie that everything is all my fault. That Jesus used Celebrate Recovery to open my eyes to that terrible lie and allow God to speak truth to it. But before CR, I just responded to my deep pain by trying to control everything for my family especially our oldest son, hoping that somehow I could get it right and make it all better. In step study, I discovered that I was actually angry and resentful at our oldest son for causing me to feel so helpless. When he would experience one of his episodes, I would feel out of control and the desire to run away would rise up inside of me. I hated to admit that that part of me was still there, but it sure was. I also discovered that I was angry with God because he had given me so many trials. And as I looked around our church, people who were way less committed than I was were having an easy time with life. God says in Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. When I began CR, I read the pamphlet on anger and I got a perfect score. I mean, apparently the committee in my head is a bunch of angry old men. I'm not an outwardly angry person, but that makes sense. I'm not outwardly anything. I get angry on the inside, then anger turns to resentment and hurt. I may never let you know I'm angry with you. I'll just sever the relationship with no explanation. 
Now, our first two years in Celebrate Recovery were amazing for our marriage. Many of my painful realizations and areas of recovery had nothing to do with Ken. In my first step study, he wasn't even on my fourth step, which is a fearless and searching moral inventory. God was healing so many broken areas from my childhood and lovingly calling me out on my control, perfectionism, bitterness, and codependency, which is an addiction to people and what they think of me. Jesus was showing me why I was acting in those ways and freeing me from destructive patterns of thought. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with a progressive and ugly autoimmune disease just a few months after we began working our individual CR programs and the peace and support and authenticity from our forever family that we had in facing that diagnosis was beautiful. And I remember looking at each other on our 25th wedding anniversary and being in awe over the year that we had had. We both agreed it was the best in our marriage. And then my second <laughs> step study entered our lives. The great thing about having a wife who struggles with codependency is that I could get away with running away. <laughs> as long as it was disguised as ministry or work. I was content to let her deal with the hard stuff. As we have gone further with our character defects, that behavior is no longer acceptable. Step six says we are entirely ready to have God remove all those character defects of character. And step seven says we humbly asked him to remove all of our shortcomings. Working these steps is changing. I still suck at some parts of life but not all parts of life. And God is guiding me through the principles one more time. I'm not sure how to overcome some of what I struggle with. I mean, drugs and alcohol were obvious, just don't drink. But I just can't not eat or not care about what those around me feel um, and not set or keep appropriate boundaries. Sobriety with those issues is not as obvious. And frankly, I struggle with them. But I'm not running from them or denying that I do struggle with them. Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure that God who began the good work within you will keep right on helping you grow in his grace until the task within you is finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus returns. Before starting my second step study, I truly believed God was growing me in grace by shining a light on my financial fear and lack of satisfaction. So I decided to work the 12 steps and eight principles for my compulsive behavior with food and money. My humanness asks now, why didn't I leave well enough alone? <laughs> it was rough. A lot of reasons why our marriage had been so good was that we didn't talk about certain things, more specifically money. My biggest area of fear, and when I was fearful, I would act out by either over or under eating or spending. I didn't want to bother Ken or upset him, so I just tried to take care of everything, and I wasn't very good at it. I have lived in a state of financial fear and had a scarcity mentality my whole life. To this day, I struggle with feeling like we are one bad choice away from losing everything and there isn't ever going to be enough. Working my steps revealed to me that this feeling has more to do with childhood fears than present reality. Because of past chaos and pain and my unspoken subconscious desire to be completely cared for. Our whole marriage, I have wanted Ken to save us. I thought it was from financial ruin, but what God revealed to me through the steps was that I really wanted for him to save us, to save me from any pain or heartache. Mm -hmm. Jesus is using this program to reveal to me that my unspoken and inappropriate expectations will ruin my marriage and usurps my one true savior. Ken is a wonderful, talented, kind, artistic, and amazing man, but he isn't Jesus and he doesn't want to be. He didn't sign up to be my savior. He signed up to be my husband, and he's really good at it. I married an amazing woman. She's very easy to live with and has a real deep and abiding faith in Jesus. We're better together. But sometimes there is conflict in our marriage, and we're learning to speak up when our feelings get hurt and express our anger in healthy ways. Neither one of us is very comfortable with that yet. We know that the process is okay because of Celebrate Recovery. And we're convinced that there is a God who loves us no matter what. We both have significant character defects, but we also believe that God exists, that he cares for us, and that he has the power to help us recover. Life will never be perfect, but we believe that it is for freedom that Jesus has set us free. And one day at a time, he's doing just that. 
Thank you guys for letting us share, for listening to us, and for participating in recovery with us. We know that um, testimony is, it's actually my favorite night at Celebrate Recovery. And I know that um, our recovery affects every relationship in our life. Um, it affects our work relationships, it affects our family relationships. If we're married, our marriage relationships. If we have children, our relationships with our children. And God isn't just interested in us changing our behavior. God is interested in changing our hearts. Mm -hmm. And he used this, this program and this process, and not just the process of walking through the principles and walking through the steps, which was major for us, but all of our step studies have been amazing but it's also the community and Celebrate Recovery. And I know that we're missing that in the way that we've had it before the pandemic, right. in our weekly meetings or our weekly step studies and our open shares. But we also know that God is bigger than where we meet, right? We have not been shut down as Celebrate Recovery. We've just moved to different platforms and locations because Celebrate Recovery is about Jesus, it's about the principles, and it's about our community. And one of the ways that we've experienced community is through these Facebook Lives with all of our colleagues and friends on the national team, and also with you in the comments as we've right. got to respond and pray for you. And um, you've invited us into that process, and we're so very grateful. And I can't wait for us to all be together in July, on July 30th and 31st. Right. I'm really, I'm so excited for this summit. Um, I think it's so interesting because actually I have the privilege of talking about change. And the thing about me, I hate change. <laughs> like it is not my jam, my friends. And if you look at the life that God has led me through, it is so much change. And right. I get to talk about um healthy ways that God has poured into that change in my life and also some unhealthy ways that I've walked through change and what I've learned through that. So I'm really excited about that. We get to sign right. up with that at crsummits.com and we get to hear there's testimonies at the summit, on the, at the online summit. I'm really excited about that. And it's just a time for us to continue to be together as we walk through this change of the pandemic. We know that our God never changes. He loves us and he is for us and he is for you and we hope that you're working your recovery to the best of your ability we hope that you're hearing others experience strength and hope and that you're sharing your own and we just we love you all we miss you is there anything else you want to say no i want to encourage you uh to invite your friends your neighbors um your family your pastor your church friends um there really is not a limitation to the summit this year. There, there has been kind of every year because of location or because of uh, gathering together as a group of people, those people. And uh, this year, somebody could come to the summit sort of anonymously and participate and find out what Celebrate Recovery is about and start to hear about recovery in a way that, uh, that they have never been able to. So that part of it is super exciting to me. I mean, I just feel like God is doing something completely new and completely different. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm excited to have you guys be a part of it. And for all of our Forever family that's been able to open your doors for Celebrate Recovery, we're so excited for you. We pray that you reach out to your neighbors. Who There's so much struggle going on in the world right now, whether it's financial instability or fear or you know just being afraid to go out now. Right, to have a place, a safe place like Open Share to be able to talk about that, to come together and worship in a socially distant way, in the ways that it's appropriate, in the states that it's appropriate, and at the churches that it's appropriate. Um, I know ours is gonna be one of the last CRs to open up because right. of the scope of our church and how big Saddleback is. And so we, um, but that doesn't mean that we begrudge any of our other sister and brother CRs from opening. We're so excited for each and every one of you. And we're really excited for tomorrow as we wrap up because it's Pastor John and Cheryl, Excellent. who are the real deal, my friends. I mean, I know you've seen them and I know you think, wow, those people are amazing. They're amazing when they're not on Facebook Live, when they're not on the podium at the summit. They are some of the most compelling, profound people mm. who have spoken life into people and have been used by God to change our marriage, our lives would not be the same if 
if Pastor John and Cheryl had not said yes to God for this right. program. So we hope that you join them tomorrow and we hope that you have a great Sunday night, that you stay well in your recovery, that you know that your God loves you and is for you. And um, Have a great day off tomorrow, uh, even yes. though we've had like 62 I feel like, is there a day off in the have pandemic? have another great so, day off. Um, all right. Thanks for letting us share our story with you. We appreciate you so much and we love you and have a good night. Night, guys.